Well, hi, my name is Andy Tidy, and welcome back to Canal Hunter Series 8. In this series, we are tracking the course of James Brindley's original 1769 Birmingham Canal as it threaded its way through all the later editions. And in this episode, we're going to take a closer look at his route over Smethwick Hill. If this exploration of antique waterways grabs your interest, don't forget to click like and subscribe. That way, you'll get to know when future episodes are released. Now, James Brindley was an engineer famed for his devotion to contour canals. That's to say that his preference was always to stick to a single contour, no matter how winding it made the end result. And whilst we've seen a lot of evidence of Brindley's devotion to a single contour so far, when he reached Smethwick Hill, there was really no path to follow, and his options were simple to go under it or to go over it. Now, Brindley had got experience of building tunnels. He'd already seen 50 miles of tunnels built by the Duke of Bridgewater in his mines at Worsley, and he'd embarked on the ambitious Harecastle Tunnel on the summit pound of the Trent and Mersey. So why didn't he build a tunnel here? Well, the easy answer is he tried and failed. Now, it's true to say that Brindley did make an attempt at starting a tunnel here. He dug a few trial bores and discovered running sand, ground that was unsuitable for building tunnels. But had the tunnel been built, I guess it would have run in pretty much a straight line between here at the bottom of Smethwick Locks and the bottom of today's Spawn Lane Locks. Anyway, any trace of that original tunnelling activity was all swept away by either the construction of Brindley's Canal, the reduced summits built by Smeaton, or the later Telford Works which created today's Galton Valley. Well, we have arrived at Smethwick Junction, and you could be forgiven for thinking that we have finally reached a substantive length of James Brindley era canal. Well, sadly, that's not quite the case. All is not as it seems. It's true that the canal track from the foot of Smethwick Junction through to the bottom of Smethwick Locks was laid down by James Brindley. But after that, we've got a couple of miles to go before we find the next section, which remains true to his plans. Let me explain. The locks here at Smethwick certainly look old, but in fact they were created by John Smeaton in 1789 when he duplicated Brindley's originals, built 20 years earlier. And they were designed to carry the increased capacity of an already overloaded waterway. When Brindley built his flight of locks up Smethwick Hill, his original line was fractionally to the east of the three set of locks that you see today. There were two channels running parallel, quite unlike those on the Trent and Mersey, where the duplicated locks share a single common intervening pound. The old photos show these twin channels. Sadly, Brindley's original lock chambers were demolished in 1973, initially used for industrial premises and then more recently reused as a housing estate. If you look at the bridge at the bottom of the Smethwick locks, you can see the outline of a second arch, and this led into Brindley's original bottom lock. This then looped around to the east, rejoining the canal as we see it today, just by the old toll house. The entrance to the lock can still be seen in the mud. Well, I have to say that I'm a little bit conflicted about claiming that the next mile or so is or isn't true to the Brindley original line. I guess it very much depends on your perspective. If we look down on today's route from above, it does indeed follow Brindley's original line. But if you view it from the ground, Brindley's original line over Smethwick Hill was 20 feet higher up. Well, I've been pondering how best to illustrate Brindley's original line over the summit. It's all very well walking along and saying, oh, it used to be up there at the treetop levels. But what I thought might be an interesting way to show it would be to take my drone at 20 feet higher up and therefore fly my drone along the summit pound, offering a perspective very similar to that which would have been enjoyed by the boaters 250 years ago.
Well, my plan to try and fly my drone strictly at 25 feet above the level of the current canal met with one or two obstacles. Firstly, there was the ever-present danger of radio jamming from the nearby Winston Green prison. They don't like drones for obvious reasons. And the second is the amount of foliage which is growing over the canal. You can see it behind me. The trees virtually form a tunnel. And that makes flying a drone through here at 25 feet extremely perilous. In fact, I very much doubt that I would make it at all. And it's not worth sacrificing the drone just for the sake of some slightly nerdy authenticity. So instead, we'll make our way through the old main line and I will fly some samples to show you what it looks like. Now, Brindley may not have actually dug a tunnel, but a tunnel does now exist on both the old line and the new line. This modern structure was built in the 1970s to replace the traffic which was overloading the Galton Bridge which stands at the far end. Well, in the absence of being able to fly my drone at the desired 25 feet along this stretch of canal, I thought I might tell you a little bit about some of the other problems that Brindley and his team faced when they built this pioneering canal over Smethwick Hill. See, it wasn't just a case of building the six locks which we have now risen. It was also then providing a water supply that fed not only the six locks at this end, but also the six locks at the other end. Quite frankly, there isn't a natural surface water supply around here on Smethwick Hill. He sent out his scouts and they managed to construct a reservoir in Smethwick. It was called Smethwick Great Reservoir. Not that there was anything terribly great about it. It held enough for a thousand locks. But it always leaked and was never a great success. They also had the lesser reservoir, which was enough for about 150 locks, which frankly isn't much either. So in the end, they had to resort to using some of the new Bolton and Watt pumping engines to put water back. But as you can imagine, pumping water back onto the main line was a slow and expensive process. In addition to the Smethwick reservoirs, they also pulled a little bit of water down from the embryonic Titford pools. They were nothing like the size that you see today. But all in all, there was nowhere near enough water. And there were regular accounts of, in the summer months, boats having to come across this summit pound half laden because there just wasn't enough depth to bring them across fully loaded. Now, Brindley's canal, which ran 20 feet above my head, only lasted for 20 years. Demand for water transport just carried on growing and there wasn't the water supply to support it and, of course, the locks slowed things down. But with the knowledge of a certain market, they decided to commit the money to reducing the summit pound to the level that I'm walking along now. So they commissioned their resident engineer, Mr Smeaton, to dig out a cutting and to reduce the height of the canal. And in doing so, he cut out three locks on both sides. So here, as the Smeaton summit is crossed by the M5, we come to the site of Brindley's next two locks. That's going to be locks eight and nine. So we've come over the hill, we've come up through six locks to the top of the hill, we've come through one lock uh, a few hundred yards further back, and now here are the missing two locks as we come down in this loop just to the west of the M5. Brindley wouldn't recognise much of this 
whilst we went through pasture land and agricultural land over the summit, we're now back into heavy industry. There were ironworks lining both sides of the canals along here. But at least here at Spon Lane, we are finally back on the same track and the same level that James Brindley would have recognised. And whilst the top three locks here on the northern end of the Smethwick summit were destroyed 200 years ago, their foundations were discovered when they built the M5, which I'm sitting under now. But that was all back in the 1960s, and there is no trace left today. Well, it's here at Spon Lane, on the outskirts of Albury, that the canal runs directly underneath the M5. It's a scene which neither James Brindley nor our ancestors from a hundred years ago would even start to recognise. This was an area full of housing and industry. It's also the point where the two old main lines diverge. The canal you can see in the distance is the new main line which heads out to Wolverhampton. Also a Brindley project and one which we'll come back to later in this series. But his initial destination were the coal fields around Bulls Hill and for that there were three further locks running down the hill here at Spon Lane. These lock chambers have the distinction of being the sole surviving lock chambers engineered by Brindley on the BCN. Sadly, they don't particularly go anywhere and therefore they are among the least used locks on the system. Well, that is it for this episode of Canal Hunter. I hope you've enjoyed exploring Brindley's original line as it went over the top of Smethwick Hill. As you can see, although the old main line appears to be Brindley's canal, actually very little of the canal bed is as it was constructed. From here on, we're going to press on and get into the coal fields of Balls Hill, taking in the Wensbury Old Canal and the Balls Hill branch. But that is all for a future episode. Hope you've enjoyed this one. If you like it, click like, click subscribe, and you'll see notifications when future episodes are put out. But for now, cheerio and happy hunting. Thank you.